So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, many, I think all of you, you here will um, appreciate how important um, ASPE's uh, sponsors are uh, for the work of uh, for the work of the organisation, and I particularly want to thank uh, Boeing this evening for uh, uh, the sponsorship which they provided for this dinner and for being very good uh, corporate friends of uh, ASPE over many years now. Uh, would you please uh, welcome Ian Thomas, who's the president of uh, Boeing Australia and South Pacific, uh, who will uh, introduce the vice chief. Thank you, Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, uh, friends and colleagues from industry, I'm delighted to be here to represent Boeing as the sponsor of tonight's national security dinner. This year, Boeing is celebrating 85 years of success in Australia. This heritage stretches back to 1927 and forms one of Boeing's most enduring and meaningful partnerships anywhere in the world. Boeing Australia today comprises the company's largest operation outside the United States, with some 3,000 employees at 27 sites engaged across the full breadth and scope of our commercial and defense businesses, with significant resources engaged across seven subsidiaries focused on high technology, high value manufacturing, research and development, maintenance, support, training, flight planning, air traffic management, and logistics. And every day in Australia, more than 100,000 people fly somewhere on Boeing airplanes. On the defense side, we forged a tremendous partnership with the ADF, one of which we are particularly proud. And over the decades, and as a company, we've been privileged to work with some outstanding leaders. And in that company, Air Marshal Mark Binskin stands tall. Most of you know Mark well, and for those who don't, for those of you who don't, there is always his official bio to reference, and I won't read that to you here, so you, I'll spare you that. But beyond the bio, probably the best way to get some insights into the man himself is to listen, as I've had the pleasure of doing recently, to a radio interview he conducted when he was chief of Air Force with, I think it was Captain Pat from Campbelltown in southwest Sydney from whence Mark Hales. And if you do tune into that interview, I think you'll take away some useful insights. For example, that he's followed his passion of flying from a young age, that he drew his inspiration from his father, who took him to air shows as a boy, and in what was perhaps a preview to the future when Mark was, I guess, eight or nine years old, helped him find his way into the cockpit of a U.S. Navy fighter on the deck of an American aircraft carrier visiting Sydney Harbor. He said it was through these experiences that he knew his heart and soul were in flying, that there was no other job for him other than fighter pilot. You'll also learn that he believes he's achieved things far beyond his wildest dreams. And he certainly became a fighter pilot, but he also flew from Australia's last aircraft carrier. He then transitioned to the Air Force. And in preparation for tonight, I canvassed a number of uh, foreign, uh, former and current naval officers trying to get a read on what it meant to leave the Navy and go to the Air Force. And I have a wealth of insights, none of which are repeatable here. So I'll spare you that too. Uh, Mark also served as an exchange pilot with the United States Air Force flying F-16s. He was part of the initial cadre and then a demonstration pilot on the F-18 Hornet. He has over 3,500 hours in single-seat fighter aircraft. In 2003, he served as the first international director of the CAOC in the Persian Gulf. He's held command positions at all levels within the Air Force, including Air Commander Australia and Chief of the Air Force. He's now, of course, Vice Chief. Fighter, pilot, leader, and a dedicated family man, he also shares his other lifelong passion, riding motorcycles with his wife, Gita, and their sons. Indeed, he's such an avid motorcyclist that he's been featured in Australian Road Rider magazine, which is no doubt on sale at newsstands now. <laughs> As any of his peers or colleagues will tell you, Mark Binskin is loyal, meticulous on detail, and a consummate professional, just the sort of person you want beside you in a fight. And while I might not share his skills on a motorcycle, and certainly not in a fast jet, we do have something in common. Both, uh, both Mark and I are married to Danes. Now the Danes as a people are usually noted for their good sense and discerning judgment. 
And at least in my case, that just goes to show you, at times, even the most sensible people can lose the plot. Another trait with the Dan which the Danes pride themselves on is equality. And so having a Danish commander-in-chief at home, I think it's to say that, along with his motorcycle, Air Marshal Binskin probably parks his leader leadership credentials at the door each evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Air Marshal Mark Binskin, Vice Chief of the Defense Force. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, I guess you've just given me a couple of ideas. I need to get the DSD guys to shut down a few websites tomorrow, so uh, <laughs> not that we do that, right? Yeah. Um, it is a great pleasure to, to, to be here the, this evening, uh, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to, to come along. Uh, forums like this we consider to be very, very important in, in what we do and being able to discuss the, the future of something that's very important to us all, which is uh, the security of our nation. And I know ASPE plays an important role in promoting the debate as well and the careful consideration of Australia's national security and defence priorities and, just as importantly, the capabilities. So I'm grateful for the opportunity that Peter extended me this evening to be able to come along and, and talk. Now, the topic of my speech tonight the ADF as a foundation for Australian prosperity provides a useful framework to consider the value that Australia and the Australian people, more importantly, gain from the current investment that we have in defence. And in turn, how we need to shape the future investment to ensure that the ADF continues to underpin Australia's security and prosperity in a changing and uncertain world. Now, my principal message tonight is that the ADF is a powerful, essential, and very active arm of Australia's strategy for enabling the security and economic prosperity that we seek with our regional partners. In fact, security and prosperity are, the mutually, reinfor are mutually reinforcing and neither thrives in the absence of the other. And to fully illustrate the ADF's long-term role in supporting Australian prosperity, we need to have some historical context. The United States security commitment to the Asia-Pacific and Australia's alliance with the United States and our regional partners have played a critical part in building the strategic stability and security that our region has enjoyed since the end of the Second World War. That stability and the security it has underpinned has been a crucial foundation for the economic developments we're witnessing in Asia today. Defence is not just an insurance policy against the unlikely possibility of a direct threat against Australia, although maintenance of a highly capable ADF is a clear deterrent against that possibility. Defence is actually a long-term investment in our security and our prosperity. It's an investment in shaping the world we live in now and the one that we want to see emerge in the future. And it's an investment that delivers returns every day. If we go back to the 1960s, our neighbourhood is very different. We're in the middle of the Cold War. The region was in the throes of decolonisation and political and social change. And it was a very challenging security environment globally and regionally. The 1970s saw a maturity of Australia's regional engagement policy. We focused more closely on building relationships with the newly independent countries of our neighbourhood. This saw a very significant investment by Australia in the development of regional defence forces through training and defence cooperation. We invested in the defence and security of the countries in our neighbourhood and in the region as a whole, and this investment is now paying dividends. The ways in which we have sought to build these partnerships over time have changed as they have matured, but our focus on building security and prosperity in the region has not. It will continue to be a major element of our approach to security in the future. Let me highlight some of the contributions that we've made over, over the, the last few years. Through our participation in the Five Power Defence Arrangements, FPDA, we've supported the defence of Singapore and Malaysia and helped develop a sense of shared strategic community. Over decades, we've worked with all FPDA nations to ensure that this treaty remains relevant to an evolving strategic environment. We've also made contributions to the development of other regional defence forces, including those of Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Brunei, and more recently, Vietnam and Cambodia. 
The ADF has also backed Australia's middle power diplomacy in implementing solutions to regional security crises. Over the past decades, we've contributed to UN and non-UN peacekeeping and stability operations in Cambodia, East Timor, PNG and the Solomon Islands. And of course, we've played lesser though important roles further afield in such as places as Namibia, Somalia and Rwanda. The ADF has made major contributions to disaster relief, both in the region and domestically. And no doubt we'll be required to respond again in the future. And I'm always immensely proud to see our men and women working alongside people who are in great need of help. The ADF's contribution to Indonesia following the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, the 2005 Pakistan earthquake and subsequent 2010 floods, and the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake helped alleviate widespread suffering and have left lasting legacies and goodwill towards all Australians. The ADF has also helped our Pacific neighbours to respond and recover from humanitarian crises and natural disasters. Recent examples include operations Samoa and Tonga, following the earthquake and tsunami in 2009, and PNG following the heavy flooding caused by Cyclone Guba in 2007. At the strategic level, Defence has been a key component of the steady development of a network of regional relationships that strengthen, strengthen trust and transparency between governments and militaries. And in fact, if you look at it, defence has been a strategic tool of choice of government in these relations. These relationships are well illustrated at ministerial and senior military and civilian level with the countries of the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus group of nations. We're also a core contributor to Australia's international engagement architecture and partner with DFAT in the various 2 plus 2 forums with partner nations. At a global level, there are many other initiatives that I could point out to in terms of the ADF support for international security. But it's in our region where the ADF has had the longest and deepest engagement. The ADF is out there every day conducting operations and building strong partnerships that support regional stability and underpin economic growth. That's economic growth that is made possible because of the continued investment in a high calibre, high capable and engaged ADF. In short, it's, val it's a value for money investment. So I'll now turn to the future. The strategic environment that has underpinned regional stability and economic growth since World War II is undergoing fundamental change imposing increased uncertainty and risk, but is also providing opportunity for Australia as we move into this decade, sorry, this century. As you're aware, the new Defence White Paper is planned for release in the first half of 2013 and will address Australia's changing strategic circumstances, including the ongoing strategic shift to our region, and by that I mean the Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific, particularly with the shift of economic weight to our region. The ADF's drawdown from Afghanistan, East Timor and the Solomons. The US rebalance to Asia Pacific and Australia's enhanced practical cooperation with the US pursuant to our alliance relationship. And the global financial crisis, which has continued to have sim significant impact on the global economy. Australia has experienced near unbroken economic growth for two decades and is one of the only Western countries to continue growing through the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Nonetheless, the economic and demographic trends occurring in our region will bring new challenges and change the regional strategic balance. We'll be living in an area of the world that is likely to see the most economic growth this century. Interdependence between countries for resources, goods, services, and ideas will increase, as will the competition. And we're seeing a revolution in communications, particularly through social media. And we know more about our neighbours, and importantly, they know more about us, but we all have less time to absorb that information. The shift of economic weight to our region has been accompanied by broad-based military modernisation across the spectrum of capabilities. This means that the technology edge we've maintained over many years is eroding now and will be increasingly difficult to maintain in the future. These trends are significant for the ADF. We'll need to maintain the high technology capabilities already in the inventory as we develop new areas. 
And looking into the future, there are a number of specific domains that will require increased focus. Firstly, cyber security. Defence has enhanced the cyber warfare capability, in particular through the establishment of the Cyber Security, security Operations Centre in DSD. The CSOC, as it's known, provides a situational awareness and in an incident response capability and also serves broader national security goals by responding to significant cyber events on Australian networks. Cyber is an ongoing strategic priority for Australia and defence and will continue to play a crucial role in cyber security for the nation. The undersea domain is becoming more critical to Australia in capability terms as broad-based Asia-Pacific military modernisation takes place. Submarines will be an important deterrent for potential adversaries by complicating operational planning and because of the submarine's capacity to deny others sea control in our maritime approaches. Space capabilities are also of growing importance. As the space domain becomes increasingly congested, competitive and contested, defence needs to build its situational awareness and mitigate potential vulnerabilities. In short, we know that Australia's regional influence is assisted by having credible, high-end capabilities in a potent and professional defence force. And in this respect, it's clear the government remains committed to delivering one of the most capable defence forces in the region. Additionally, assuring that we have organisational capabilities to design, build, operate, deploy and sustain the ADF's future structure is a high priority for us. The workforce, including skills, composition, labour force and demographics, logistics, facilities and joint capabilities required to support future capabilities often receive less prominence than our major platforms and our major systems. However, these capabilities provide the essential glue that will ensure that our force can continue to deliver the results that government and the Australian people expect of us as a defence force. So, in simple terms, Australia's changing strategic circumstances mean that in the coming years the ADF needs to build a defence capability that can support our national security interests in a neighbourhood that is growing more capable, more confident and more outward looking. And at the same time we need to accommodate constraints on the resources we have available to us and live within our means. The US Alliance will continue to be crucial in assisting the ADF in maintaining the capabilities that we will need. Through this alliance, Australia benefits from access to US intelligence systems and advanced high-end military capabilities that we could not afford to develop on our own. There are also significant opportunities to increase our cooperation with the United States in the region as part of our broader approach to regional security and prosperity and as the US rebalances its force posture towards the Asia-Pacific. We'll be able to build off this enhanced engagement to further grow regional cooperation and capability. We will work with the US as we work with many other countries in our region to find ways of achieving more capability together than either partner could achieve by acting alone. In April, Australia welcomed the first rotation of 200 Marines to, to Darwin for a six month deployment. In the coming years, the intent is to gradually increase the rotational presence of the Marine Air Ground Task Force to around 2,500 personnel. And this increased US presence builds on a well-established schedule of combined and joint exercises that we already do and will provide tangible benefits to Australia through enhanced ADF training opportunities and improvements in interoperability with the United States forces. In particular, increased opportunities for combined US-Australian training exercises will allow ADF personnel to draw on the Marines' amphibious experience as we train and prepare for introduction of our new amphibious landing ships. Finally, I'd like to discuss ADF policy and posture following our drawdown from Afghanistan. In the last decade, the value of Australia's investment in our warfighting capability has been demonstrated in our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's also reflected in our very effective contribution to other operations such as our maritime security contribution to the Middle East. Defence's contribution to international counter-piracy efforts aims to ensure maritime security, including for Australian maritime trade off the Horn of Africa. 
Our presence promotes broader regional security by disrupting and deterring the illicit trafficking of, trafficking of people, drugs, weapons and money that support international terrorist networks and the denial of freedom of movement to pirates. As such, ADF operations are again directly supporting economic prosperity, in this case more globally. The ADF's drawdown from Afghanistan will naturally lead to further emphasis on our policy and posture in our own neighbourhood, and rightly so. Minister Smith has highlighted that the 2013 Defence White Paper needs to carefully work through what impact the drawdown will have on the ADF and how to ensure we maintain the ADF's high level of operational capability and readiness. It is also noted that we will inject even more energy into building relationships in our region. And in doing this, we will capitalise on the substantial partnerships we have already built and look to further strengthen them. A key element of this effort will be delivered through the Defence Cooperation Program in which we help regional partners develop their own defence-related capabilities. We're at an important juncture in the way we think about our defence relationships. Just as the relationships we have today look much different to the 1970s, we need to work hard to ensure that they are much deeper and much broader in the coming decades. A highly capable and engaged ADF will be instrumental to this so we can continue to make timely, significant and valuable operational contributions in the region in time of crises or time of disaster. Now, History tells us that over the next decade there is a very strong likelihood that the ADF will be relied on to conduct both stabilisation and or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations in our region. We live in a region with a high volume of natural disasters and the ADF continues to be a highly valuable asset to provide a rapid and meaningful contribution when required. In conclusion, the ADF has and continues to provide a highly effective and value for money strategic pillar for Australia's future. Defence is a long-term investment in developing strategic partnerships for our security and our prosperity that delivers returns every day. A highly capable Australian Defence Force is the core tool in doing this. And I'm optimistic about the future of the ADF and of the fantastic men and women who serve day in, day out around the globe on operations. We face some big challenges, some of which I have outlined here this evening. But they present us with some big opportunities as well. Opportunities to develop capabilities for our evolving security needs. And opportunities to work more closely and more effectively with the countries of our region and our major ally, the United States. And I'm confident that, as we've done in the past, the ADF will continue to play a critical role in securing Australia's security and Australia's prosperity into the future. Thank you very much. Okay, back. Well, thank you uh, very much for that um, very substantive uh, presentation, Lenny, and I suspect we're going to hear a lot more of the uh, um, the idea of uh, the ADF as uh, as a pillar of regional security. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we go uh, as we go towards the next defence white paper and quite possibly even the white paper after that um, now uh, quite possibly <laughs> the, the the things you can say when you're no longer in the uh, in the public service uh, but uh, uh, i think we've uh, got a very good um, uh, foundation for some interesting uh, q and a here so i'd like to uh, throw the uh, the floor uh, open to the audience Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think we'd all agree, and obviously many of us had a career in the ADF and are supporting the ADF, that uh, the military are a very important way of ensuring security and prosperity. But they're not the only tool available mm -hmm. to government. Uh, I wonder if you'd make some remarks about uh, the developing national security community and how defence works with the other arms of government to get a whole-of-government approach, whole-of-nation mm -hmm. approach towards prosperity. Yeah, I'd, uh, if, if I look across the, the whole of government community, one of the areas, and I didn't mention it tonight, uh, that we work more closely with, and more in the humanitarian side to, to start off with, you know, AusAid, the, the, the Civil Corps, all those areas are coming together a lot more. And there's a, the, for those that don't know, there's a small group that live out at Queanbeyan. Anyone from Queanbeyan? A third world nation. Um, 
where they're uh, called the the, uh, the Australian Civil Mills Centre, and it's a small it's a small group. They're uh, they're only sort of in the, the mid 30s in in, in numbers, um, but we draw people from across uh, cross government for that, and they bring together a lot of the. Uh, I guess the, the doctrine and uh, developing the, the coordination that we have in that civ mill space. So that area uh, is, is an area where we're, we're seeing it. We're seeing a lot more cooperation, I guess, in the intelligence and security uh, organisations across government as well, a lot of partnership there, um, knowing that we each bring a particular part to that, uh, to that, that part of the, the national security. And I won't go into too much detail, but we're seeing a lot more of that. We're seeing a lot more collegiate approach uh, a lot more mature approach, I'd say, as well, uh, that may not have been there you know, five or ten years ago. And I, I think that's a good culture that we're, we're, we're having developed uh, across government, across government organisations. So without going into sort of too much classified, I think that uh, you, you've hit it on the head. It is a part of our success at the moment. Yeah. Okay, first Alan Hawke, then uh, uh, Raiden Gates. Um, Alan Hawke from Queanbeyan, Mark. Um, <laughs> I wondered whether you might like to say something about Pitch Black and mm -hmm. most particularly about the Indonesian yeah. participation this time. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, thing, and I'll, and I'll start by, by saying you know, people people look at a lot of the high end uh, capabilities we have, and they say, "Well, no, we don't use them, so they are an insurance policy." But in fact, the high end capabilities we have are out there day in day out, engaging in the in the region in exercises and building a lot of this cooperation. And it's only when other nations are willing to exercise with their high-end capabilities that you start to get a lot more of this, this partnership. <clears throat> and one of the examples is uh, fire power defence arrangements. The FPDA exercises that the fighter and strike assets have always participated in. Now, that's our high-end capabilities and we operate with, with theirs. And when you look at Pitch Black that we run in Australia every second year, you look at the high-end capabilities that are there. Uh, nations such as Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, um, the United States bring high-end fighters. They bring the, their, their highest technology. They'll bring the AWC, AWACS aircraft. Singapore this year, for example, brought uh, Strike Eagles, their latest F-16s, their latest AWACS aircraft that would be one of their first deployments. But importantly this year, this is where Alan's going, we had participation by the Indonesian Air Force with Sukhois. Now, that was a statement. That was the first time those aircraft had deployed out of their country. And that was a major effort for the Indonesian Air Force to do that. But the fact that they deployed them, they deployed them here, show a great level of trust and a great level of cooperation that had been built up at the tactical and operational level over years in engagement, but also that strategic level partnership between chiefs, chief to chief. Uh, and I guess that, that had grown up over years through that, that engagement. So it's a good demonstration about how you know, uh, the high-end capabilities are used day in, day out to continue to build strong regional relationships. Thank you. Uh, Raiden. Benny, thank you for your uh, presentation. I always like to see a young naval officer do very, very well. <laughs> but um, I was going to make an announcement tonight. I was going to change back in uniform, so I didn't uh, think it was... I would, I would have accepted that. Can I, can I continue what Alan was just asking, but throw it the other way, mm -hmm. uh, the challenges that we have with uh, the lower end of the spectrum, so our immediate neighbours like Papua New Guinea, into the Asia, mm -hmm. into the Pacific area, and now, of course, more of the concentration in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. How are you developing relationships at that lower end? Yeah, it's a, it is an interesting... Uh, problem because you're working high end interoperability and you're working the, 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 the lower end interoperability and, and I think what you're alluding to there is some of those Pacific nations have different security concerns. Some of the concerns might not be there in 50 years with global warming. Some of them have economic security concerns uh, and then just you know, the, the ability that do they have the infrastructure, do they have the, the support mechanism. So again you'll see in the future high end capabilities from the adf out there engaging the, the the region more than what you currently see when we get the amphibious ships you'll see a lot of them engaging in the a lot of those uh, the the forces on there medical people uh, engineers going out with the ships and and nation building and, and building relationships uh, similarly as you go into the 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 indian ocean as well i think having those ships and having that that sort of maritime power will give us a chance to engage in the Indian Ocean as well. It's interesting, you, 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 uh, whenever I brief people that come to Australia, we put up that map of Australia and it's, you know, 
you, you know, the one that's in the, the, the DC room, and you talk about, and people think of us as a, as a uh, in a land-based sense a lot, as a continent, but in fact, when you look at that, we are an island, it's just a big island. Uh, we're, a, we're a Southwest Pacific island, we're a, a uh, Southeast Asian island, we're an Indian Ocean island, and we're actually an Antarctic nation as well. So they're, 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 the, the span of the, the security issues it'll face us in the future are quite broad. Yeah. Uh, now I've got Nick Stewart and then I've got uh, Neil James. Sorry, Nick, I didn't tell the joke, mate. That's what you asked for yesterday. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I thought, I thought. No, look, I won't say I thought it was all very funny because. <laughs> uh, the, no, uh, sorry, a procurement question. Mm -hmm. um, um, if you want to buy SP howitzers, for example, that that's quite obviously an army function. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're buying a, a boat, it's a, a navy function mm -hmm. uh, or a ship. No, it's a boat. <laughs> and uh, aircraft are obviously uh, for the air force. Mm -hmm. If there's a joint plan, yeah. uh, a joint issue that, uh, of equipment that we're buying, mm -hmm. it seems as if, to, as far as I understand it, there's no owner. You mm -hmm. don't really do very much other than looking after training and operations and various other <laughs> things like like that. Um, uh, shouldn't shouldn't someone actually own the joint projects as well? Yeah. Um, that's a good point. If I start back, talk about capability managers in defence, there's only four capability managers in defence. Chief of Army, Chief of Air Force, Chief of Navy and uh, DEPSEC INS. And that's because to be a capability manager, you raise, train, sustain. So you're, you're right, a lot of those, the items naturally fit into those, uh, those four areas, but there's a lot of joint capabilities, those, that glue that pulls it together. They haven't traditionally had capability managers, but I do bring those to, together and sponsor those those projects through a new organisation that David Hurley had uh, started up when he was the Vice Chief, actually you might have, Ken, the Joint Capability uh, Division, and they are responsible for bringing, bringing forward these joint capabilities that don't have an owner uh, and, and pushing them through. And uh, as the Joint Capability Authority, which I am for defence, it's my job to make sure that the glue is coming to be able to bring the capabilities together and also anything that's procured in uh, Air Force, Army, Navy or, or INS actually works across the, the joint spectrum. Now that is only new and it's one of the lessons that we've learned over the, the years, but no, I, I count myself as that, that joint sponsor and the, the manager there. I'm Neil Jones from the Australia Defence Association. I'm oh, Neil. Yeah. I, I have to ask a question of the Manchurian candidate, the Navy's man that they finally got to the head of the Air Force. Um, and I know you'll have to choose your words carefully because the last bloke who answered uh, questions at an Aspie dining in night at a Don Corleone moment and got, was off to an ambassadorship. Uh, but my I've asked for Moscow, does that count? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, my, my, question, my question's a simple one uh, mm -hmm. and it's to do with the next white paper and it's to do with how the team's going to tackle it and how you're going to keep morale up into the team because the people mm -hmm. doing it may very well fe feel that they'll, they'll be involved in a reasonably nugatory exercise given that uh, the alternative government, who may still win the next election, uh, have promised to junk at the moment they uh, win office. Um, so how do you intend to keep morale up uh, given the amount of work that's required? And I can, and I can see Brendan shrugging his shoulders here in front of me. <laughs> how are you going to keep morale up um, and, and, and keep their focus uh, uh, when it's likely that a lot of the effort may very well uh, uh, be nugatory. Uh, some of it will be useful, yeah. but an awful lot of it won't be. What's the morale know. juice this week, Brendan? It's Shiraz, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, no, Neil, nothing that we do as we go through this white paper and this force structure review will be nugatory in the, the future. Uh, everything that we do and look at as we need for a balanced force in the future and all the, uh, the risk assessments and the, you know, what, what you can afford, what you can't, what you might add, what you might not, the various components, all that work will lead in to an, the next white paper, whether it's in five years or two years. So I don't believe it's nugatory work, to be quite frank. It's the same region. I, uh, we don't have an issue with morale in, in working that, that space at the moment, to be honest with you. Hello, Mark. A Andrew Davies from Aspie. Uh, let me ask you a question slightly tongue-in-cheek, but there's mm -hmm. a, a point to it as well. You, you talked about the ADF as being a good investment. Uh, the tongue-in-cheek part is what is the return on investment? What, yeah. what, what percentage are we getting? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you measure it? 
I think uh, it, I, I couldn't give you a monetary measure, and, that, and I'll give you a tongue-in-cheek answer. But um, in the, the broader terms, and if I use an example, and the best example is Japan. Right? The East Asian, so the East Japan earthquake and, and tsunami, we were one of the first nations to deploy. And having high-end C7... That's a plug for Boeing again, sorry. Well, and having a high-end capability in the C17 allowed us to get people up there within about two days. Now, when that earthquake occurred and that tsunami occurred on, and we saw it, all saw it on TV, there wasn't a C-17 closer than Hawaii. In fact, the, the closest C-17 was on top of descent into Hickam. And when we saw that on TV, the first thing we did was we called the crew and as they landed, they immediately went to crew rest. And while we were preparing the loads back here and preparing the government response, that aeroplane was turning around and coming back. That allowed us to be in Japan within two days. Now, at one stage, we had three, the three serviceable C-17s, three of our four fleet up there. The other aeroplane wasn't unserviceable, it was in deeper level maintenance. Had it been available, it probably would have been there as well. That commitment from Australia, a defence commitment with AusAid involved as well, they, they went up there, they were moving Japanese defence force personnel around and equipment around. Though, besides the United States, and besides Japan, we were the only other nation doing that. Now, I'll put it to you that those three C-17s did more for Australian-Japan relationships in the last decade than any other thing that we've done. So I think that's probably the best example I can, can give. In the other high-end uh, exercises that we do around the place or the engagement, wherever the defence forces do, whether it's uh, hatter exercises or high-end war fighting, it builds a lot of confidence and a lot of trust between nations and builds a, a far closer relationship. But I think the C-17 example is probably the best example that I, that I can give you. Yeah, I, I can't resist editorialising a little bit on that as well because uh, in the last few days uh, I think uh, uh, Stephen Smith in, in uh, Tokyo gave mm -hmm. uh, a, a very significant announcement which didn't get a lot of uh, uh, coverage about um, establishing a new basis for technology cooperation new framework. Uh, That's right. with the Japanese on, on defence issues. Mm. Um, and I really do believe that it was our response to the triple crisis that somehow opened a door in terms of Japanese thinking about um, um, how we might cooperate with each other as, uh, as two defence forces. Um, uh, Benny, if I may, I might, uh, I might uh, res take my right to ask the, perhaps the last question, unless anyone has a, a burning question out there. But uh, uh, there's been um, a, a little bit of media interest in the last few uh, days on uh, Leon Panetta's visit to uh, uh, Auckland. Yeah. And... Um, uh, the uh, very gracious move that the Americans have made to allow New Zealand vessels to uh, come in back into American harbours, um, even though the New Zealanders have not yet uh, reciprocated in terms of uh, providing access to American naval vessels. Mm -hmm. But we, we do see for the first time in a generation the potential for um, trilateral cooperation mm -hmm. uh, in a significant way uh, beyond intelligence cooperation uh, to resume between Australia, the US mm -hmm. and New Zealand. I was just wondering if there's anything you might be able to say to us about how, how you think that process might evolve um, and indeed um, you know, your, your take on New Zealand as a, as a partner for us in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Pacific uh, particularly. Yeah. I'd, uh, I'd say it, I think that was an important move uh, from the US, uh, although the, the New Zealand government hasn't, hasn't necessarily responded uh, yet. But it shows that there, there's a thaw in the relationship now, will we ever be back to the full answer? So I'm not, not, not sure. But the trilateral cooperation has been increasing. The bilateral has been increasing over the last couple of years. Again, the trilateral is starting to, to work again in, in, in various I guess, security spaces that, uh, that we, we work in a you know, three eyes, four eyes or five eyes environment. Um, New Zealand brings a, a, a niche for us in our engagement in the, the South West Pacific. They, uh, we're, we're seen as the big country in, South, in the South West Pacific. Uh, New Zealand's seen as a smaller country with, a, with similar cultural ties. And that's really important to us as we, as we want to engage those, those nations. They, New Zealand brings a different insight, a different view, just like when we talk to the United States, we, we bring a different view to the region, to, to them. So having that trilateral cooperation uh, and I guess what the other bit that we're, you're not seeing as much is the US now are engaging more in the Southwest Pacific. Previously, there had been a US Coast Guard participation down there. Now you start to see more US Navy participation. Uh, and we're all working together 
in the, to the future to be able to have some of those the smaller nations be able to protect their sovereignty you know, from fishing, uh, their resources and, and, and all that. And I think that's the aim of uh, the big aim that I think that we need to take away from this trilateral cooperation that we're having. Yeah. Well, Benny, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, look, I think it's been um, a, a really substantive speech. I'm grateful to you for, uh, for coming and, and delivering it to us. I suspect we're going to be having a lot of discussions over the next um, several years yeah. about the nature of Australian engagement, re-engagement back into uh, our own region. Um, we never, as the Americans say of the pivot, we never really left, but we are going to uh, uh, re-emphasise, and I think that's really the, uh, the Australian position. So I thank you for uh, uh, really giving us a, a, a detailed statement on uh, uh, the department's thinking about uh, where we're heading in that direction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to please thank the Vice Chief of Defence Force. Thank you very much. Thanks,